So hello and welcome to You So You. This week we're talking about English smocking, so grab a brew, put your feet up and let's get started. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I'm thinking about summer clothes to make. And I'm working on a pair of linen shorts at the minute and I will have fabric left over. I'm hoping it's going to be enough for a top, it should be. However, I have in my head a picture of a smocked top few different versions of it floating around in my brain and um, this is partly so Amelia's fault because she took a I think it was the Mabel dress it's a Tilly and the Buttons dress I believe and instead of shearing it she swapped the shearing out for smocking and it looks rather lovely um, and I always did like the look of sheared garments I just don't fancy doing shearing the thought of sewing with shearing elastic scares me I may try it at some point, but it's not on my radar at the moment to, to have a go. Um, but smocking would give a similar impact, if not a greater impact. Because if you're not familiar, English smocking is the sort of smocking that you see on the old uh, 18th century farmer's garments. It's a way of controlling the volume of fabric using embroidery on pleats. Um, you'll sometimes hear it referred to as uh, embroidered pleat work and the, the concept of pleat work is not a new thing at all there's evidence going back hundreds of years of uh, fabric being controlled certainly across Europe and through the, throughout what is now the UK using pleats that have been sewn in place so smocking as it's known today or English smocking as it's known today is a development of that it's been named smocking because the, the garments that the farmers wore that were shaped using this, this form of fleet work were known as smocks. The name stuck with the technique. So we have English smocking. I have also come across in my little rabbit hole on the internet, Canadian smocking or North American smocking, which is far more sculptural. Uh, whereas the English smocking is it embroidered stitches on top of the fabric. The Canadian and the, the North American smocking, it uses the, the stitching on the wrong side of the fabric and creates texture on the front of the fabric. That I want to have a go at as well. Um, possibly not for a garment, maybe for a cushion, um, but it looks interesting. Today we're talking about English smocking though, because that's what I'm thinking of using for a garment. Now I've not done smocking before. I've not hand pleated uh, fabric to this extent before. So we're going to have a bit of an experiment and I'll flip the camera around and we'll have a go at hand pleating some cotton and then putting some smocking stitches over the top and we'll see how we get on. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do with smocking is we need to mark up our fabric. And this is a scrap of cotton that I'm just going to do a sample on. It's 16 inches wide. I've made a note of that so that when I've finished doing the smocking, I can actually work out how much it's, it's shrunk up by based on the spacing of the pleats um, as I'll need that calculation to work out how much fabric I need to make the next project. So I am going to be using my French curve, the straight edge of my French curve to mark the pleats. I'm going to put the numbers the right way up because that's going to be a lot less confusing. So this is marked in centimetres and I normally work in inches for garments. So um, yeah. Uh, it'll be fine. So I switch between the two quite frequently. I am British after all. So I've got centimetres marked on here. It's a uh, total length of very, very nearly 41 centimetres. So I am going to start my pleats just a couple of centimetres in from the edge because if I'm making a garment, I'm going to need seam allowance. So I'm going to make my first mark there and I think I'm going to go with two centimeter gaps. If you are an experienced smocker you may well be wondering why I'm putting them so far apart. I don't know, do you normally put them closer? Uh, let me know down below. So I'm just marking these with dots on pencil, in pencil rather. Now, I know that certainly in the sedate there is a an iron-on dot thing um, that you can get uh, to, to mark up with. Um, I haven't looked to see if we can get that in the UK. We might be 
be able to. Don't know. Um, but this doesn't seem like too onerous a task. And I'm going to stop there. So I've got three centimetres, well, almost three centimetres at this end. Um, again, seam allowance for garments. So I am going to essentially do a square grid. So I'm going to put the next line of dots two centimetres down from this one. And obviously if I find that my pleats are too deep or if I find that the rows are too far apart or too close together or anything like that, I can adjust it next time I do it. This is my first go. This is my practice. This is my learning how it operates. So I'm going to measure down two centimetres from a few of these dots. If you want a straight line, you want to be lining up three points to get a straight line. Don't know why it works like that, it just does. So I'm going to lay my straight edge. I've made sure to, to mark this end where I'm starting so that I, I've got the same starting point and everything lines up uh, properly. So that I can uh, see what I'm doing and get things exactly where I want them to be. Because you do want your pleats to be perfectly lined up for smocking. So again, I'm going to mark every two centimetres. I'm going to keep going in the same way till I've got enough rows to practice with. Okay, so I've got all my dots marked out. The next step is to put in this line of running stitches. Now, I've opted to do the slightly slower method. You can go in at one dot and out at the next, and in at the next, and out at the next, and just go the whole way across and evenly space it. I'm choosing to go in one side of the dot and out the other side of the dot. That way, all my my thread is going to be on the back of the work where I've marked it and I know it's uh, yeah it's actually the back of the piece of fabric as well so this is an old bit of sheet so I was looking at the hem there Um, so I've knotted the end of my thread I'm using a double just for strength because we're going to be gathering along here and I'm working along inside and outside of each dot so I'm catching a smaller bit of the fabric in each thread and as I say each that way all the the stitches the, the bulk of the thread is on the back it's going to be quite easy hopefully for me to then see which side is the back and which side is the front I'm going to do that for all of my rows leaving a tail at either end so I'm going to be gathering down later on so this is going to take me a few minutes, so I will um, save you the trouble of watching me slowly stitch each of these. I will obviously be evening out my two strands later, which is fine with gathering by hand. Sometimes having two strands of thread in there is a little bit more helpful from a strength perspective. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'll come back to you in a sec when I've got... All seven rows with their line of gathering stitching in place. Okay, so now I've got all seven gathering rows of stitches in and I've tied off this end. So I've tied the top two together, the middle two together and then the bottom three together. Next, I'm going to take hold of all of the tails at the other end, the left end, and I'm going to move the fabric down the thread. So we're not pulling the thread, we're moving the fabric.
Okay, so that's uh, compressed down pretty far. So yeah, that, that's compressed a lot further than I was expecting. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. So now we're going to tie off these ends to make sure that the pleats don't go anywhere. And I will obviously trim the threads once I'm all tied off so they don't get in my way. Okay, so I've measured the width of the pleated down fabric and it's come out to from edge to edge, so including the bit that I've left unpleated, at two and a half inches. So that's quite a substantial amount of reduction in uh, in size. I mean, I could probably get away with not gathering it up quite so tight, but um, yeah, it is just my first go, so that's okay. So I've brought the, some embroidery floss over and I've come up through the outside edge of my first pleat and I'm going to attempt to do stem stitch. So I need to go over that and through that with the so over the first pleat and through the second pleat with the thread beneath the needle. And then we go across to the next pleat in the same way. So the idea is to use the lines of the gathering stitches to help position your smocking stitches. And you're holding the pleats together at the top and then when you remove the gathering stitches there should be still be some elasticity to the fabric. What you don't want to do is stitch on the line of the very first um, gathering stitch or the very last. They're there to help control the fabric as you're working. Now I'm not expecting this to be the finest piece of smocking ever as I say it is my first go. What I will need to work out before I do an actual garment is if this is the right size of pleat for me or if I want shallower pleats. I suspect if I have my dots closer together that the fabric won't get so much smaller when you, you gather the pleats up. Um, but I will need to, to check that. There is a fair amount of information on smocking out there, so I should be able to find out or find somewhere to help me calculate exactly how far apart my pleats should be to get the the result I want and how much fabric I'll need. Uh, but with this going down to two and a half inches from 16, I mean that's huge 
compression. Okay, so there we go. Nearly all the way across, I think. Yes, a few more pleats to go. Apparently, if you're right-handed, you work left to right, and if you're left-handed, you work right to left. Which makes sense. Okay, so that's me all the way over. So I'm going to pop my thread back down through this last pleat. And find some way of fastening it off. Okay, so underneath my line of stem stitch, I am currently working a line of outline stitch, which is worked the same pretty much as stem stitch, except this time we're keeping the thread above the needle as we're working. So there we have stem stitch and outline stitch, sort of. Uh, I think I need to focus a bit on getting my stitches taut before I move on to the next stitch. Um, but there we've got the two rows. These two stitches can apparently be combined into something called wheat stitch, where you would do the outline stitch first and then the stem stitch. So you'd get a similar effect to this, but the Vs would be going in the other direction. Okay, so I've moved on to my second uh, smocking line, my second line of gathering stitches, I'm just above it. And I'm going to have a go at cable stitch. So this is again going over the, the two pleats at once. And the first, uh, we're keeping them roughly in a line. The, the stem stitch and the outline stitch, we were coming through the pleat at an angle. We're going to come horizontally for this one. So I'm going to go over the first pleat into the second pleat with the thread below. Mm. 
then with the thread above we're going to repeat that movement so we're crossing over two pleats at once thread below for the next stitch and thread above Thread above. Last one again below. Don't think it's perfectly straight, but uh, for a sample, it will do. Yeah, it's definitely not straight. Um, I started just above the gathering line, and there's the gathering line there. Oops. Okay. Definite more practice needed. Um, but that's cable stitch. It does look a little bit like a chain. So we'll fasten that one off. Okay, so I've come about halfway down this section. So I'm just slightly over, uh, or just slightly under halfway down from one line of uh, smocking stitches, gathering stitches to the next. I'm going to see if I can actually end up in the same place on the other side, or at least uh, even. We're going to try the wave stitch, which is apparently uh, one of the more elastic stitches uh, for smocking and it's a traveling stitch so we're going to start making a straight line between two pleats so i'm going to go thread above and go through second pleat and pull it taut from what i gather from from the research that i've done if you're traveling downwards you want the thread Above the needle, and if you're traveling upwards, you want it below. So we're going to travel down diagonally into the next pleat, and we're going to do that another time with the thread above. I'm going to keep these waves fairly small. So we're just going to go down two times and then with the thread below we're going to do a straight stitch now that we're at the bottom keeping the thread below the needle we're going to come up level with the the last one that was moving downwards And again, we're going to come through level on the next pleat over. So I'm actually using my needle. Try and map that out. And with the thread above, we'll do a straight stitch. Okay, so we're travelling down, so we want the thread above. Again, we're lining up our needle. Now we're at the bottom. 
going to have the thread below. at the top, do a straight stitch with thread above. Okay, so I worked a second row of uh, wave stitch there just so we can see them in multiple uh, rows. You can obviously do that as many times as you want. You could do them going the other way and create little diamonds, all sorts of things. We are now going to attempt to do honeycomb uh, smocking which is a little bit more complicated and we have to go behind the fabric as well as between the pleats so we're going to start by going through those two pleats and I think one thread over the top there okay so that's those two pleats together then we want to go down Ah, so maybe I shouldn't have come through to the front of the fabric there, so we'll go Okay, editing Zoe here to uh, rectify the uh, sterling camera work that is uh, in this uh, section of the video so what I'm attempting to demonstrate is the structure of the honeycomb stitch. I'm going to show you what that looks like in my little diagram here. So you're going across the top of the fabric for the horizontal lines and behind the fabric for the vertical lines. Um, so it sort of zigzags across the lines of the page or the, the pleats effectively. Um, so you work your way across, going across the top of the fabric, behind the fabric, across the fabric, behind the fabric um, in this sort of crenellation format and then when it comes together you've got diamond shapes okay so uh back to my stunning camera skills Obviously, if you are an experienced smoker and I'm doing this wildly wrong, do let me know. Do hmm. so you want to go through that plate? Well, we can see the right shape starting to, to form at the top. The honeycomb is going to create like a diamond um, between the stitches. So I think we might be on the right lines. At least we're getting a similar result to what I'm expecting to see. Which, uh, for this point in time, I'm okay with. 
similar is good enough for now. This is certainly a bit more. Okay, so I've done three rows total of the, the honeycomb stitch. I mean, I can tell just looking at it that it's not straight. Um, and I'm sure you can as well. So I mean, clearly I'm going to need more practice before I work on a full garment size bit of smocking, particularly as I'll be making an adult garment. That's a lot of stitching. Um, so I want to obviously work out the correct pleat size as well as get better at stitching in straight lines um, but let's see how this has turned out so we're going to take out the gathering uh, stitches then already we've got a bit more width than we had when they're all held together so that's actually come out at uh, about four and a half ish inches total, and there is a fair bit of stretch in each of these. I think the honeycomb is the stretchiest rather than the wave stitch, um, but there is some stretch in the cable, there is some stretch in the, the outline, and the stem stitch but yeah i'm definitely getting the most maneuvering from the honeycomb so that's my finished little sample as i say i'm going to need to do some calculations and some more sampling to to work out how much fabric i'm going to need how big my pleats need to be and what stitches i want to use for an adult garment so here is the sample and i've got loads of ideas of how i can apply this to a smocked top. Uh, once I've had a bit more practice, I need to sort my tension out, I need to sort out my calculations of how much fabric I need out and decide which stitches I want to use. I may, for, for my first smocked garment, I might use the thread that matches the fabric so that uh, any wonky stitches are less obvious. Um, but yeah, I've got loads of ideas for that floating around my brain. And if you want to see how that turns out, you'll want to be subscribed down below because it's going to be a while before I actually get to that top. In the meantime, I'm working on the shorts that I need to get done first to find out if I've got enough fabric for a smocked top um, to go with the shorts. So that will hopefully be coming up next week if I get the pattern adjustments properly done and finished and it working and the zip arrives in time. Failing that, I'm hoping to get a weaving video put together, which may be out here next week. But again, I'm waiting on yarn for that. Um, if neither of the bits come through for those two, two videos, there will be something else. I don't know what it is yet, but there will be something next week. And I would love to see you there. Um, in the meantime, you might enjoy this video that's on screen now.